Okay. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Long Range Tactics Podcast. Appreciate y'all joining us um, today. We're we're gonna have a good conversation about uh, match directing and all the cool stuff that comes along with that, and you know, di- di- dive into some other things that some of you want to hear about. Um, first off, I'd like to thank one of our sponsors, Falcor Defense. They've come on strong this year. The new seven MT7 actions, the new seven and MT7 actions are out. Um, go check them out. The MT7 is their new hunting action. I got to play with it at SHOT Show. The good thing that they've done is they've listened to a lot of shooters. Like I'm telling a lot of act- other action companies out there to kind of listen to this. If, if you want feedback, go to the people that use your actions or use actions. They've done a good job. They found a few issues like they all do in the first uh, iterations. They've fixed them. They've done the right thing. So thanks, Falcor, for doing that. Uh, also, go check out their new competition. And uh, they do have a new lightweight hunting um, chassis coming out, which is exciting. Um, for you that have listened before, my first section is shit that's cool or cool stuff you've seen recently. Um, I'll go first, uh, maybe, if I can figure out what it is. Yeah. So our, my first thing, uh, I just barely got it today. This is the new, for you watching, uh, this is the new uh, Eagle stock from Graybo. Uh, it's supposed to be one of their new lightweight stocks. This one's in Cryptek, my favorite camo, of course. Um, I'm going to do a full review on it. There's some things that I already like about it, some things that I already don't, of course, like we all have our own opinions, but... Uh, it's good stock. Uh, I've got to do some research to figure out what kind of what makes it different than the Phoenix or the is it the Phoenix, the Phoenix that they have. Um, so it's going to be interesting. And then I got another new stock back there. I'll do a review on too, the new manners. And I'm super impressed with the new manners, but I'll do uh, re- I'll do a review on it pretty soon. What Matt, what have you seen lately? Well, shot show just happened and man, there's a flood of stuff this year. So, I mean, the I think the, one of the bigger takeaways is all the different companies jumping into actions and barrels. I think that's actually a good thing, the way it's progressing. Uh, there's some viable options. There's a few that might need some refinement, but there's some companies coming out with some pretty cool stuff as far as uh, actions and barrels and stuff. And then um, one of the companies I'm affiliated with, obviously, MBT, has some a lot of cool stuff this year. That zero stage trigger got some got a lot of attention. So looking forward to getting one of those in my hands. So. But yeah, tons of stuff, actually. Yeah, I saw Baker down there, and he kind of walked me through it, and it was pretty impressive just the way it did it. You know, I'm I'm one of those guys, like in hunting and different situations, batteries always scare me, you know, when you've got too many batteries to go with. But, you know, when that thing can recharge in a matter of like a couple minutes, and it'll shoot like 3,000 rounds before you have to recharge it and everything, that's pretty cool the way they've thought that through. Mm-hmm. And um, it'll only get better. Yeah. Yeah, I did see a lot of action companies. Some of them need help man but there were some others that had some pretty legitimate actions that i think are coming out and we all know that's what we need right now after the shit that's happened lately so <laughs> companies that you... remain unnamed <laughs> we won't go there i've already been in a couple of facebook pissing matches so i'm good today josh what do you got <laughs> um i think those uh obi the old balls inc wool adapters he just came out with or he came out with last year those yep. right there, man. I finally got to play with those things. Those are pretty slick. Yeah, I had him on the podcast last week, and we went through it. Man, uh, we actually talked about him creating the SkyPod and how he went about doing that and on tracing it on paper and all the shit. And it's a cool story. So uh, yeah. tune in and listen to that one. It should be released in the next couple of weeks, week next week or something. But, yeah, these OBI things are pretty sweet. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm impressed with them. Yeah, it's just like this one's the QD, so it just goes into your QD – on mm-hmm. your stock and then like mount it on your harness or wherever yeah because it, it drives me freaking nuts when you got a sling and the sling keeps coming off your shoulder when you're like hunting it's always like walking its way off and then you're pissed off trying to throw your gun around and everything so it's it's a cool idea yeah it was a year year and a half ago sky called me he's like i got this idea i want to run past you and we both said the same thing like up front I hate slings i wish i never had a sling i, I just hate them just get a, get away from him. He sent me a couple of the early ones, and man, it was awesome. And like people talk about, like how heavy it is or whatever. Save a full race rifle on you. Like it, the backpack offsets the rifle weight, so it's kind of neutral. It feels really cool. So, yeah, there cool was 
there was another one called, I think, I can't remember what the guy is. It's like a Franken stud sling keeper or something. And it was kind of a simple idea, but it was pretty much a sling uh, stud that stuck up with a round thing on top that you put over it that your gun couldn't slide off. But the problem is, is your gun's always sliding back and yeah. forth too, right? And that's what drives me yeah. nuts too. Like you hit a branch and then it goes back. And this way it's always locked right there and it doesn't do that. So I've got to install it on a couple of my backpacks and try it. I'm excited to try it out. Yeah, I did the same thing. I had like one of the little Magpul, like little leashes, just ran off a QD and I'd just hang it in there, but then it'd slide up and down your pack. This one doesn't seem to move around much, so I'm pretty stoked with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are a little bit expensive because everybody bitches and moans about price, but here's the deal. When it comes to comfort, I'll spend a little bit of extra money for a good, comfortable thing that you can carry it around. And yeah. it does work for hunting rifles if they've got a QD. And then I've got, he sent me, I've got like, uh, this one's a M-Lock. So if you've got an AR yep. M lock that you want to carry, so mm -hmm. he's got a couple different options. Um, but yeah, that was that was a good episode that I talked to him about. Um, all right, well, some stuff you guys have heard about. Um, if if you're listening and you have questions as we go through this, uh, comment. Um, I'll, I'll try and pull it up. But we're just going to go kind of through some stuff we've talked about. This next section is our main section. This is brought to you by Utah Air Guns. We appreciate them. They've come out with some new options. I got to hang out with these guys at Shot again. And, man, if you haven't shot an air gun, you're missing out. They are so much freaking fun. Um, you know, the SD consistency and everything else when they come to them is awesome. I've noticed that MDT has uh, come out with a air gun chassis, and so has Masterpiece Arms. They've kind of followed behind with that. So it's kind of cool to see these um, different – variations of shooting start to grow and the path that they're starting to take and competition shooting, I think is leading into a lot of that. And that's one of the first things that we kind of wanted to talk about right Matt. Yeah. So with the air on the air gun thing, remember the air gun thing is bigger outside of the U S so that kind of has driven a lot of it. Um, it's kind of bleeding over into the U S now. Um, so, but it looks like Utah air guns has the, uh, the tank thing figured out on some of their newest models, which is kind of the catching like the sticking point for me is that big tank elevating the the bore axis. It looks like they have it figured out now. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, they've gone through the cool thing about those guys is like, you'll call them and you'll go through a build list and they'll completely custom build you a, a rifle right there. And the thing is, there is like, well, that shit's super expensive. But the way I've told everybody, I'm like, if you look at one of my voodoos, my voodoos were, you know, three or four grand, whatever you want to build them out as. And this air gun was about the same with the gun and the tank and everything. But I've got to go buy expensive 22 ammo in lots for my 22. In air guns, you don't have to do that. You just go, like, I think a can of 250 is like 25 bucks. So you go buy the 25 bucks and then you just keep going and refilling your air tank. And a couple of the guys around here were talking about getting one of the compressors so we can have it here. And then they all just come to my house and fill it up. But after you have the initial cost of the air gun, there's almost no cost um, in shooting the air gun. And my SDs, I think I'm, mine, I'm shooting a 25 cal pellet right around 960, 970. My SDs are like two over 30 mm -hmm. rounds. So they're nuts. They're crazy accurate. And they sound like a freaking sledgehammer when they hit a pigeon. It's cool as hell. But um, so we, we were going to get into... Um, what were what were the topics? I've got to remind myself. You sent me some. I, I know I had to pull the text too. Sorry. Oh, so go. I'm gonna I'll, I'll start this off. Uh, um, one of my favorite things about Josh is uh, he's not a one trick pony. He actually has a very well uh, rounded background. Aside from military stuff, everyone likes to talk about that, but I want to talk about stuff other than that um, because that's how Josh and I kind of hit it off and started. Like, you know this, you done this, you done this. Like, yeah, I've been there, shot that. What do you know about it? And that was that was pretty cool. So, Josh is pretty diverse. His um his experience with a bunch of different platforms is kind of ridiculous. So, Josh, why don't you give us a little background, man? Okay. Um. Well, funny story to start. Um, you guys talking about air guns? That's how I started. I started shooting air gun was my very first competition I ever signed up for way back in the day when it's like doing the 4-H Crossman 810 or whatever it was with the air rifle and that's how I started shooting and from that it kind of bled over into shooting trap and skeep in high school and 22 and then the whole military thing I shot throughout the military competitively and getting back out of, out of the military I got into the teaching side of things and then that led into two gun three gun and all that and they just kept 
expand. Anytime I find something new or interesting, I jump into it and try it out. Yeah, I think that's where I met you too. Uh, you you were teaching with uh, oh, what's his name in Arizona? How come I can't think? Today's one of those Independence days. Training. Independence training. Yep. And um, Cook uh, introduced us, and um, you know, I think that's where and for matches, of course. But yeah, I mean, then you've kind of come out. You've been shooting a lot of different platforms. I mean, you've been shooting a lot of uh, our homeboy Cluffs HS stuff. Um, I've got a couple of his guns. Love, love the HS stuff. And what are you shooting now? HS still. HS and then uh, loophole stuff. Is that is that what you're saying? HS and loophole. Those are my two main ones. Look at you guys all freaking loophole it up. <laughs> it's been a while, man. <laughs> all freaking team loophole. Loophole's done a good job, man. I met with them at shot, and they're just doing a phenomenal job. I had a, a podcast with Tim, which is the new marketing director, and. And I sat down again with him at shot. Man, they're just they've they've great they've got a new life in loophole, which is uh, you know, a new breath of fresh air coming through it. And it's fun to see. You know, I looked at their new uh range finding binos and I'm excited to see when they come out with the integrated stuff when they do. I'm pretty sure they will. You know, and then they've got uh what is it, the new three and a half to ten? Is that what no, it two is? To ten. Two, two to ten. Two to ten. Yeah. It's a, it's a five five power, so Okay. First focal plane, good looking optic. Um, I like it. I need to get one, of course, because you just can't live without good optics. That's how they are. So, Josh, you just hosted the NRL Hunter. It was the first NRL uh, event of 2023. You had it down in Arizona. You got snowed on. Um, I know a lot of people kind of have asked me in the past, like, how do match directors go about setting this stuff up and planning it and doing this kind of stuff? And you know, from like a regular PRS event or a standard NRL event, the hunters are completely different. And you've got to kind of think differently when you set those up and how you set targets and how you hide them and different things like that. Do you want to kind of go through like your your thought process in building like NRL hunter stages? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of different. It's kind of the same. You know, like you still, the thought process has to go in when you're designing the stage, like how big – is this target going to be for how hard of the shooting position is it going to be or how hard am I going to actually hide this target? You know, and that's all things I take into consideration. Like one stage, if it's like a belly stage, it's going to be small ass targets a long ways away, you know, because the shooting position is going to be easy. The targets are going to be easy to find. So the shooting side of that has to be the difficult aspect of it. And then some of the other stages, you know, if it's a really crappy position that I'm putting people in, it's going to be a great big easy target you know so you don't you don't want to just go completely difficult across the board like you can't put a little target with under huge time constraints or under real tight time constraints off in a shitty position because it's just going to destroy everybody wait hold on there though because his version of a big target is different than my version of a big target <laughs> his version his version of a big target is a prairie dog this wide at 540 yards you were prone you were prone Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't yeah, yeah. Okay, in yeah. at all you're I'm good, I'm like, good. Uh, go ahead please continue but dog. i just want that fat, they're a fat prairie dogs they're huge yeah very fat they're like uh -huh. woodchucks tenth and a half got it <laughs> shoot better <laughs> <laughs> pray for no wind on targets pray like for, that yeah i mean but you have to have those stages you know you have to have those hard stages in there you know that's what makes the match you can't have every stage a gimme easy stage or there's no dividers so you have to have that two to three stages that are no shit hard and if you score well you're probably going to win the match right it separates everybody because that's that's the hardest part as the match director and all three of us have done it it's yeah. like trying to keep your top guys at a certain point, but also not let your, your bottom people completely bomb out. So they're having fun yeah. at the match. And I mean, yeah, I think that's probably just, the hardest part of it. You can't design a match for your top 10 guys. Cause everybody else is just going to hate it. Cause it's going to be way too hard. You know, if you go the other way and you design it for the bottom 25%, then your top guys are all going to be tied. And it's going to come down to a tiebreaker. We actually, mm -hmm. you know, it's getting to the point now, uh, that last, the loophole classic, uh, Austin just cleaned both days like that's in, that's insane you know that's amazing shooting for one but to clean two 100, days 176 shots yeah and not one miss that's not pretty, one miss. that's 
nuts. That's impressive. Yeah. That's where, I that's where we're at currently. The yeah. same thing happened at AG Cup, right? What's his yeah. name? Yep. Day two? The last day, the same, day. same guy. Yep. But uh, if you look at after Austin, the next four places all dropped three shots. And they're all tied with three misses for over two days. And that's insanely good, you know? Yeah, that's that's definitely above my freaking pay grade there. I mean that, but that just goes to show you there's definitely levels. But as a match director, you know, kind of talking about it, like we talk about setting size targets for ranges. You know, how do you how do you figure that out mathematically? So guys that are going to go out there, guys or gals that are going to go out there and practice, how are they going to efficiently set up a target? And try to figure out what size of target they need to set up to practice so that they can be good at this type of stuff in your mind. I go off of two MOA. That's like yeah. my baseline yep. target is two MOA. And then depending on what I'm trying to stress for that stage, I'll either shrink it or add to it. Like Matt's Prairie Dogs, that was obviously shrunk from a two MOA target. But <laughs> I know you didn't shrink was, the targets. You just it was prone. It was easy. So. Yeah, the, the two the two MOA rule is easy, and for people that don't want to do the math, just whatever distance at, double it, and there's your inches. Like that's mm -hmm. the that's the easy rule of thumb. Double your distance, select that. So if you're at 500 yards, put a 10 inch plate out. Done. Yep. Yeah, and here's the thing, guys and gals, you've got to think through this, and I kind of want to preach for just a second. Not everyone, and this is what was cool about the NRL 22. Not everyone has. Uh, a range like all three of us do all three of us have been blessed with long ranges now if you've only got a 200 yard range or 300 yard range shrink your target smaller than that try to get you know some of that under control because that's how you're going to better yourself as a shooter now i get it when when a good buddy of mine helped me start setting up my range he was putting freaking bus size targets out there at 400 and i'm like that's great, dude. You're getting somebody to just to feel good because they hit that steal. But at the end of the day, you're not helping yourself at all become a better, more proficient shooter. So mm -hmm. as you're thinking about doing this or you're going out and setting up a club or something like that, um, you know, and, and of course, kind of back to Josh's comment, you've got to do that depending on what kind of position they're going to be shooting from. Is it a barricade? Is it prone? Is it, you know, how does that go through it? So kind of go over how you would set that up, Josh, as far as uh, say you've got a, a barricade on a stage and then you go prone and then you go barricade or, or kind of explain how that stuff's all gone out in your mind. So for like a multi-position stage or something like that, um, I kind of look at like the timelines. So I always like to figure that 10 seconds for like a hard if I go 10 seconds per position, that's like a harder design to stage. So if I go to like 15 seconds per position, then I can kind of throw, give them like an easier, like a feel good style stage into the way I think of it. And then target wise, I still try and stick to either that two MOA depending. And that's, you know, depending on the barricade too. If it's like a standard PRS hard set East coast barricade, then you can go a little bit smaller because everything's solid, but. Out here on the West Coast, when you're on a rocking ass spool or a freaking tree branch or something like that, and you kind of bump that target size up a little bit because the shooting position's compromised at that point. Yeah, and a lot of those situations, you've been like kind of tucking. I and I haven't had time to shoot one yet. I've ROed one or two of these, um, but you guys are starting to like tuck them up under trees and start to putting them in hunting type scenarios where they've never been they've just been a big steel plate out in the middle of a field or something and now you guys are kind of changing that up right yeah so for like the hunter style matches we try and keep it as most as much as you can you know like hunting style so you try and put them where places you would actually see animals you know very seldom very seldom do you see like something standing in the middle of the flats so you push them over to the trees or you put them underneath the trees in the shade or places like that. You know, that's another way you can task the difficulty too, is when it comes to trying to figure out your lighting conditions for these matches, you know, with the match at gunside, it's a, you're shooting out to the West. So all your sun, you're backlit throughout the entire morning. But as soon as noon o'clock hits, all that shit goes into the shade and all those stages become a whole lot harder in the afternoon when they're not lit anymore so i mean that's goes into figuring out your shooting hours too you know you only get to shoot from basically 8 a.m till 12 o'clock before it gets extremely hard for everybody shooting after that 
Yeah. And kind of to your point, the cool thing is, is if you really think about that in the hunting aspect, in the hunting aspect, I do a lot of glassing in the middle of the day because why? Because I'm looking for like antler shine. I'm mm -hmm. looking for different things under that. And this kind of, if you, if you picture it that way and kind of start training your brain, I, I've heard a lot of really good hunters. They like, they train their brain to look for stuff. Now, one thing that I did find um, that a lot of guys are having issues with was uh, they trained their brain for movement, but then when there was no movement from a target, they could never find it. And then it really kicked everybody's ass if they were uh, colorblind. There was that one match yeah. in Colorado. Them poor guys didn't didn't have a freaking clue what was going on. I mean, and that goes back to like old school observation techniques and stuff. You know, even talk about with hunting, you don't look for, you know, man, you don't look for an entire deer. You look for an antler or a head or an ass, you know. That's the same thing with targetry. You don't look for an entire target. Like these targets, like some of them are still rust colored or we don't paint any of them. So, you know, they get rusty. We just leave them rusty. Uh, the CD matches, full competition dynamics. Like your best bet is looking for that piece of strap. Strap, supporting yeah. Supporting the target. Because that's, that's the line. only thing that stands out. That's the only man-made thing that you can see out there. And that's what you should be looking for is like T-posts or black straps or crossbars because if you look for a full target especially now that some of the targets are like turkey shaped or antler shaped or gargoyle you're not looking for like square shapes anymore you're not looking for you know something an entire thing look for small flat lines and you'll find them a lot easier yeah and that that comes back to training your eye like this year i hunted uh one of my best friends had uh one of the best deer um, units probably and honestly in the United States, uh, these giant deer were out there and I've never seen my, I mean, my dad's told me stories about how big deer react to different things. And I've never seen it really until this year where I'd be glassing and all of a sudden I'd catch the top of a buck and he noticed me and I'd go to put my phone scope on there cause I wanted to record it. And I look back and he was gone. I'm like, what in the hell, where did this deer go? And I looked and I looked and I looked really hard. And all of a sudden, all you could see was the points of these antlers just kind of turning really slowly. And that's kind of the cool thing that kind of mimics both of them is big deer are freaking smart, man. They lay down. They don't move very hard. We've seen them. They'll actually lay their head down on the ground and things like that. And that's one of those things like there's there's things that I've seen online. People are complaining like NRL hunter matches. They're like, oh, this doesn't relate to hunting at all. I'm like, all right, give me scenarios where it doesn't relate, and I'll give you scenarios where it does relate because it does. And then one of those is gear selection, right? Because it, all these freaking uh, PRS matches, they got freaking baby strollers and shit. You know, they're pushing stuff everywhere. And I noticed on one of your stages, you did it like a, it was like a float plane design and i love that because it's going outside of the box it's not doing what everybody else does and it's really making them think about it because a lot of this sport is mental i mean that's a, an issue with this sport i've had for a long time so kind of explain to us and both of you have done this um kind of explain to us your thought process going into like an nrl hunter because this could carry over into hunting itself I want to hit on the mental thing first. You brought that up. And I think that's a huge thing. And that's another stressor that people don't realize when they design this. And we had two stages in particular at this match that were a hundred percent a mental. And that was it. That was the one thing that we were stressing. Like that float plane, that was an incredibly easy stage. The targets were I mm -hmm. think 300 and 400 yards yep. and they were like 12 and 16 inch diamonds. They were huge. They were big. Yeah. And generous. The whole, the whole way we set it up is if you went up there and went prone, everything was right in front of you. But just that stage pissed off people who are used to taking their big heavy tripods, their big game changers, everything like that. They were so pissed off going into it that they were just blind and they couldn't see the target right in front of them. And it was absolutely hilarious, I thought. So, I mean, that's just something that those guys were not prepared for was have a mental to be mentally handicapped, apparently. So. But. All right, so I'll go through my experiences. I shot uh, as an RO on Friday, right? So um, I, I shot all 18 stages on Friday and then RO'd uh, with the wife on, on Saturday, Sunday. It was, it's always an amazing time. Jen, Josh takes care of us. It's, it's awesome. Um, so I walk into that stage and I'm being directed around this tree and I see this contraption with a, with a bucket and a scale. And so dude tells me to drop all my stuff. I'm like, 
okay. He goes, you get 20 pounds. I'm like, well, that's not going to go very well because my rifle's already 16 pounds. I'm like, well, I just don't get a bag, but I need my range finding binos. Okay, let me see what I got. I'm rummaging through my bag, and I had one of those little uh, milk toast bags, little thin guys, sand bag. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. That'll work for position. That'll work for a rear. Like, okay, put my binos in there, ditch the tripod, had the rifle with the, with the bipod on it, and that little bag. And I was like at 19 and a half pounds or 19 pounds. Like, oh, perfect. I walk up, and as I'm setting my stuff down, time starts, and I could see the first target straight in front of me. I was like, okay, well, I look down, like, okay, that's prone. And I look for the next target and I could see it kind of with my eyes, like double check, bam, bam, ranges, I lay down and bam, bam, done. And it was super simple, but hanging out and watching people get tripped up from just the scale was amazing. Cause I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. but this is so I, I do teach a few online classes to do with like match shooting and stuff to kind of help these newer people out. And one thing I tell you is like, Hey, if you're if if you're getting frustrated with something, stop and think like a match director would for one second. Like, what is their intent here? And if you can figure out their intent, it'll take some of the confusion out. And like, okay, now I have a path to go. Like, I understand what I'm supposed to get out of this. And I knew when I walked up to this, I'm like, okay, he's already putting all these restraints on me. I I'm not gonna freak out because I can't use my gear. I know these targets are gonna be pretty manageable and probably prone, or it'll be like off a tree or something, pretty stable. Like the position's gonna be good. I just knew that going into it, it's going to be generous. If the position's good, like I'll be fine. And so I, I had it easy, but watching people lose their minds and then just self-destruct on the stage and forget to put their mag in or just all this sort of just haywire stuff, guessing at the ranges, that was wonderful. Wow, and, yeah. um, and like, how can you shoot that target if you have no idea how far it is? The things like that people that's part prioritize of are, is insane. You know, like I, yeah. I was watching people making their gear selections is insane. Like when we started the match, we briefed everything can be shot from a nine inch tripod in a bag mm -hmm. or a nine inch bipod in a bag. That's all you needed for the entire match. But yet people, like you'd say, wouldn't take like a range finder or something so they could take their huge tripod. Well, the way the stage was set, if you weren't about 12 to 18 inches off the ground or anything higher than that, you were in the trees and you couldn't see the targets. So a tripod was absolutely useless. People would run up there with a tripod yep. and just throw it on the ground next to them because they couldn't see anything anyway. Wasted weight. Exactly. But it's it was that was just a fun one, I thought. Yeah. 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 The other the other mind bender he had was uh he'd start you on a stage and then up oh, years, time stops, your position's actually over here. Cause I ran up and then there's a flag where you're supposed to shoot from pointing right into a tree. I'm like, well, I don't know how to navigate this. Like so there is the no place you can see through this. So this one was a little more directed towards uh, competitive shooters. So that's the other thing I like trying yeah. to separate competitive shooters versus hunters. What are the worst words you hear as a competitive shooter on a live fire range? When RO tells you, what's what's one word you just hate to hear? Dive. Freeze. Yeah, oh, freeze, right? freeze. Yeah, freeze. Yeah, or wrong right? target. Yeah. That's, when you someone's standing behind you and they say, freeze, right there, you're thinking, yep. shit, I'm cued. That's the end of this. Like, I pack my bags. I'm done. So that's yeah. what they were doing to shooters. They'd run up there, get set. They tell them to freeze. And right then, anybody who's been like, especially in like the two gun world or something like that, you're like, "Well, fuck me, I'm I'm done with this one now." So <laughs> yeah, immediately, immediately. So Dave, it was Dave Thompson, and yeah. he stops me. Actually, grabs my shoulder and said, Dave, like, yeah. "Freeze, freeze." And I thought, my first thought was, "What did I mess up? Like my guns yeah. pointed down range. What am I doing wrong?" Because I started looking around. I'm like. Uh, I don't know if I had to like step on something, like what happened? And uh, he goes, nope, your new shooting position's over there. Your time starts now. I was like, um, oh, uh. and uh, that's, that's AJ me alive because I couldn't find the targets. The set, like those coyotes in that, with the glass I was yeah, using, so blended those... in so well, and they were gone. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. But that that's cool to me because this is the way I look at that. If, if you've been a hunter for long enough, you, you get what they call buck fever. And mm -hmm. everything that you just learned goes out the window. Like everything's like, whoa, there's a big yeah. freaking buck. Like, where's my range finder? Oh, shit, where's my, you know, everything just starts going like that. And I like that because I could see that playing with people's head. And then it puts them in that scatterbrained, holy crap, now I got to start over because I was going into this with a plan. And now the plan is just completely mm -hmm. changed. And now I've got to go to this new thing. And th then they've got to, in their brain, push replay. They've got to try and restart this all over again. So I, I like, I like yep. the idea of that. 
Is that is that what your idea was behind it? Uh, no. Yep. And, yeah, uh, and it, it did a good one job we of did, that. Uh, last year was so. This year you had to touch a flag. Last year it was just you have to be right of a flag, you know, and that's just leaves people enough rope to hang themselves. Because good old boy Nico, we all like Nico. He hey, is a he match shooter to the T, right? Yeah, hundred percent. That's what he does. Is he shoots matches. So one of the stages was he had to shoot right of the flag, and it was on this rickety ass barricade, and a, some weird rocks were piled up there. So Nico runs up there and he shoots off all these crazy ass positions, like hunches himself down, contorts himself around, and shoots off this wobbly ass little fucking rock, and like all this crazy shit. And then the, some hunter was like, he gets done, he cleans it, he gets done, he comes over and he's like laughing and joking about it. And I was like, watch this. And this hunter runs up there, walks just to the right of everything, lays down prone and shoots the entire stage, cleans it. He's like, he's allowed to do that? I'm like, yeah, he's right of the flag. Like, you don't have to shoot off all that weird <laughs> shit. But just by him being a PRS style shooter, he sees that and he immediately just starts shooting off of it. That was the tire at this one. You had that truck yep. tractor tire laying on side and yes, it was it clearly was. a prone stage. And I couldn't believe how many people ran to that tire and were trying to figure out how to shoot from the tire when you could just lay down next to the tire. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was so easy. The answer was literally right there. And they just, ooh, so brain see, dumped I mean, it. I think a lot of that comes from, you know, that goes back to what you're saying about don't be a one trick pony. You've ran enough stages or you've seen enough stage designs to you have, where you can think outside the box. like. When you run up there and your stage implodes on you, you can just figure out an easier way to do it, you know? And that's mm -hmm. some people are so razor focused on here's the flag. I have to shoot like on it, regardless of how shitty the position is. And I could just simply move six inches and shoot completely prone. It's yeah. It's well, and I mean, that is, that's the difference in PRS and this. I mean, in PRS, you're told, hey, you've got to shoot off of this. This is what you have to yeah. shoot off, and then you've got to make it. As a hunter, we want to get the most stable position possible. If there's a rock and then there's a big prone spot, I'm definitely going to use the prone spot unless I have to utilize a rock to get a higher vantage point. Yeah. But, I mean, why wouldn't I want to go prone, you know? And that comes that's, back. Go ahead. That's the, Well, that's the fun thing about field matches is there's so much more critical thinking to it you know, and well, they're blind. So you don't get to see how the other guy did it in front of you either. You have to decide how you're going to shoot it. And sometimes it's completely a terrible idea. And sometimes it's great, you know, but everybody gets to shoot them different. And that's kind of RO in these like Matt got to do or see, or I have before when I RO. Yep. RO in these matches is awesome because you see every single different way possible to shoot a stage. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I saw what a hundred and some odd people like, you know, and, and how they would work and the team is a whole different dynamic, but just, you know, the stage that we were on, it's just amazing. And then I cruise around, you know, help Cody and, and uh, other ROs and stuff and get to watch a little bit too. And just watching the different takes on things that, okay, you think, you think you've got something ironed out and then like someone comes up with the most simple thing. You're just like, okay, all right. That was very effective. Or you see mm -hmm. the opposite and you see someone do some really bizarre off the wall stuff and, just crash and burn and it's like ah i, I yeah. yeah i would probably learn from that one but uh don't do that again but uh the field matches that have been running up here the stages are real real straightforward um and it's kind of similar kind of idea of like we just want to shoot more the, we, we are, are kind of transitioning away from the two and one scoring just because people like to shoot more at these matches mm -hmm. if you're giving them the targets ahead of time they're not blind so um hey this is a negative slope figure out how you're going to use it. Here's a pile of rocks, figure out how you're going to use it. There's no wrong answer. It's just your answer. And if you hit the targets, then it worked. So that's, that's awesome. And, and I see this online a lot. Social media is these people want to say that uh, the match shooting doesn't matter which format it is. The match shooting doesn't have a direct correlation to like real world stuff. I'm like, yes, it does. And then when I'm teaching people on the hunting side, I teach them how to use a rifle and how to use a gear. It doesn't matter if it's a steel target or a live one, you treat it the exact same. So mm -hmm. you, you treat that live animal like it's a one MOA target. So it, it, it really, it, there's so much crossover. It's unreal. Um, and I got to say, Josh, we had quite a few of the skill shooters this go yeah. around rather than last one. And that was cool. And if, if for the people who don't know the skills, you can sign up and do the match for reduced cost. And you're not on the, the leaderboard, but you can go. And then um, you're given as much help as, as you ask for. Oh, wow. And I had a couple of people, you know, I'd stop them because I didn't have much of a backlog. I'd stop them. 
after their time was up, I'm like, hey, man, we got some time. Let me show you how to kind of fix this. We'll f- get you on the targets, and you're going to shoot for a – I don't care. You're going to shoot, and you're going to hit those targets. You're going to learn something before you leave here. And and these people had the biggest smiles on their faces. Like, that was awesome. Thank you. Like, and that that was cool. And Ted and his kids, too. That was a, that was a, that was a good time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that as an RO when I did my first Hunter matches, that was fun. I recorded a lot of it. Um, They actually hid behind my bus. I had my bus there, and my bus kind of blocked them so they couldn't see. And they had to come up and engage around a rock. Uh, I think there was a rock, and there was a couple prone positions. It was one target. They just had to move each time. And watching every one of them kind of go through that also gave me a lot of ideas. You know, there was a lot of shooters that I'm like, man, I would have never thought of that. That's cool to watch. And I think that's one of the cool things about the NRL Hunter series is it gives you the opportunity to be able to RO um, and shoot before Mm -hmm. everybody else. But if you're not comfortable shooting, you can still come RO and you can see how everybody else does it. And in your mind, you're like, all right, now I see how this stuff works and it's not as overwhelming. And I tell everybody that in any of the matches, I'm like, go RO first or just go hang out and watch because, um, you know, as me growing up, I had a hard time getting myself to go do, you know, things that made me scared in, in the long run. But after I figured out, Hey, these things made me a better shooter. I'm like, I want to go RO some of this and I want to go do some of this. And not to mention the camaraderie that these matches bring, man, I've met so many good friends doing this. I mean, that's where all three of us met for matches. Well, I think there's something to that too, is like you were saying, like a lot of people are just, well, I've had a couple guys who volunteered to come up and help and they had no idea what they're getting into. And their biggest concern was like, I don't want to be in the way. So like that was what they're worried about. I was like, there at no time, if you're volunteering, there is at no time that you're going to be in the way of anything. Like just come help out, you know, and we, I was able to put them with experienced ROs because we had enough help to help them, you know, teach them how to do it and stuff. So, I mean, it's a great experience. If you don't, if you don't want to shoot, definitely come out and just learn and, you'll get put with somebody who knows what they're doing and can teach you or guide you through it. So it's, you definitely won't be a handicap at all. And one of the new things that air released that got me kind of interested was the, um, and maybe you guys can explain this to me because I don't know um, the team, the team version of it. Now there's a team Mm -hmm. set up. How how does the team part of it work? So, okay. I'll tell you from like the shooter's perspective. So last year we shot Josh's match. Me and the wife did as a team. Now there is no better test of a marriage than to do that. <laughs> it's like back in a boat in the water. I'm so- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But imagine 18 times of that <laughs> in one day, it's a marathon. It's a mental marathon. And uh, obviously, you know, you, you both have, so this is what I'll say about the team. So you have to be able to recognize each person's strength and weakness and then build off that. Because if, if someone's not very good at, you know, finding targets, well, you're going to have to coach them along. If, if you're a better shooter, like there's a give and take to all of it. So you got to, you have to know your, it, other than your, you know, the generic stuff, your dope and your gear, yada, yada, yada. You have to know the person, right? You have to know what they're good at. And if you're like me, you're not very good at um, communicating tactfully while in a stressful environment. So um, read between the lines there. And so <laughs> you get an extra bit of time. to to shoot things as a team. Now, what I didn't expect shooting this format was, hey, there's two people that are gonna have to operate in this little tiny area under a time constraint. You gotta figure that out on the fly because that's this whole blind thing. So you really have to to be good at gear gear management, communication, finding the targets and and then working out your shooting sequence. So our plan going into it was I was gonna shoot first. I'm gonna find as many targets as I can, guide her to the first one and then talk to her and, and we'll move around to the other ones. Well, what I didn't expect was she actually, she was super good at finding the targets, like all of them, like incredibly good. Like she was picking up the ones I wasn't finding very quickly. So that really worked. And I was going to rush through and shoot and get as many points as possible. But then the transition and stuff, we, we killed a lot of time. We did pretty well. Um, but like, and we shot one other team match before it was a PRS style team match. So it wasn't much uh, figured out on the fly. So a lot of it's just figured out on the fly and collect as many points. Cause you get 16 points possible versus the eight per stage, which, mm-hmm. Hey, you turn around and you're doing a 14, 15, actually you're doing really well for a team. Uh, if you're even getting that many shots off. And, and that's the thing that's really surprising or owing the team part is watching how many people don't get even half the shots off. 
So they're out of eight possible rounds they they have in the air, they're only hitting a couple. And so that's, that's the big takeaway from the team thing. And uh, it's actually hard to practice to be honest. Cause like that, that environment, so you actually have to go in being able to work very well with your partner and have like a mutual understanding of skill level and the communication part. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to it. Um, I don't regret shooting as a team. I'd love to do it again, but I'd like to have the other person, you know, be able to work a little bit more with them and not be married to them. That'd be cool. Um, but yeah, the team things is, is just taking that, that individual aspect and doubling it. I mean, doubling everything. Cause, and you're going to get frustrated. I saw a lot of teams just get frustrated in how they plan things. Cause it seemed like one person would go down the rabbit hole in an idea and then they couldn't pivot out of a bad idea. They just couldn't do it. And watching that just play out was, frustrating as an RO because you're like man both of you did the exact same bad thing like you're just like not enough bipod height or you're looking at the wrong target or something and just get out of that funk so it's pretty cool and if there's teams that do that want to do this again I would highly encourage you to reach out to people that have shot teams before and, and ask what how they've done it because there's a bunch of videos on just the individual stuff but not a lot covering the team aspect of it and I think there's a lot more there and there's some people that do it really well in the, the team shooting stuff, right? There's actually tons of uh, matches, but the fine range and engage portion of this is, is a lot harder to do as a team. Because, man, if one teammate is lost and doesn't see any of the targets, well, you're only getting half the points. Shit. So, <laughs> I mean, that's just the truth of it. It's 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 a cool experience, though. Last, the last time I shot uh, team matches was I shot I shot the Vortex Extreme the first couple of years. And that was, you know, some of some of my first tastes into the team match. And you learn a lot about your freaking partner and if he's bullshitting you yeah. or not in a hurry, you know, and it, it was fun. It was interesting. That one kicked your butt because there was more running than or movement than there was shooting. Yeah, that was like a seven miles, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, and you were only you only fired, I think, like 30 rounds max. Yep. I shot it, that. It sucked because I'm like, man, for the amount of movement I've got, I want to freaking be able to shoot a little bit, you know, and then the team thing and we what we went into that not understanding, um, and maybe that's something we can talk about real quick. We went into that not understanding what we needed to compete. Honestly, you know, the first year I went, I went with a, a Harris and a backpack and some binos, I think. And we were trying. We didn't. We, our Harris wouldn't go high enough. So we were trying to use our backpack to get up high enough. I mean, we got our ass kicked not understanding going into that match what we needed, but. So into these matches, what are like the, the maybe the five basic items that you have to have to be able to compete uh, and do good at it? Yeah. Well, just real quick on like your topic where you're talking about those team matches. I love team matches. I shoot a lot of team matches. And for a crossover application, I think that's as good as you're going to get for like your mill and your Leo guys. I yep. mean, take your partner and go shoot one of these because every single stage is a blind UKD stage at that point. I mean, it's you can't get better than that. And or the other on the other side of that, I've taken a lot of shooters and because you now you're allowed to coach on the clock basically. And there's no better test than, than test and fire, you know, and you put somebody on the clock and you can actually coach them on the clock. So when I did it with newer people, I have them shoot first. So then you can coach them through. And if there's any time left, then you shoot, you know, it's like the best of both worlds. But five things you have to have yeah so you know it could be uh, what tripod uh range finding binos you know that's been one that has come out and i honestly think you know voodoo was one of those things that really got the 22 thing started but i think the nrl hunter and matches like this are really what got the range finder binos you know going because the, no one cared about them until now and now all of a sudden everybody's like holy shit, dude, it takes so many variables out of everything just to have that set of binos. So, you know, yep. stuff like that. Yeah. I'd say the range finding binos would be your first one. I mean, it's just, there's Which one? so much, so much simpler. If you're going to take one item. Which binos are you using? I use the Leicas. Mm, I've heard good things about the Leicas. I really like the Leicas. With the AB? To, you can load your dad up to a thousand yards and they, mm -hmm. they're still clear. Like, so it's good glass plus ballistic solver out to a thousand. I put my eyes on all, about all the brands, and I got to say they're they're my favorite so far. Oh, I so, yeah. yep. Until I have a decent pair of loopholes that I can use, I mean that's going to be it. Uh, this last match <laughs> I used, a, yeah. 
this last match I used uh, a pair of the Fury 5000s and man, um, you know, I, I just, my eyes don't agree with that, that glass. And I think that's something you kind of have to realize when you're buying these things is you mm -hmm. kind of have to know what you're getting into in the brands and go try, try some, but outside. So you can kind of see, you know, what the glass is doing and look at different colors of things. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a couple brands that just, they tint so their glass because they have to. I mean, and so where he broke up. Yeah. He froze on us. I don't know where he went. There he is. All there right. Is. Go ahead, Josh. Josh, you got us? Oh yeah. I got you now. Sorry. If I froze. Know what you're saying? Talking about your, your, your furies and that one stage where you said you couldn't find the the coyotes. That's it's, that's the reason. I mean, it's just the, for so like the furies, they have like that Brown tint, right. For the glass color. Yep. And those coyotes were Brown. So like when I put yeah, them in with in, Lycos, in grass, yes, in brown grass, in brown grass. So, so I put them in with Lycos and they stood out. I went mm -hmm. back and looked through Mark's Furies, and good luck. They were gone. yeah. And suddenly I didn't feel so bad after you told me that, and I was like, man. So I caught the T post on the first one, and I was looking for the second one, but I was counting on a contrast or an edge to stand out, mm -hmm. and I I had nothing. I just I had nothing. It was gone. So, um. You, you you have to before you make the investment in the range finding binos it's they're all amazing pieces of technology they really are if you look at how far it's come from a seven power you know one hand range finder which they they a lot of those are great as well but i mean they've got their limitations but having that all in a package especially that spits out a ballistic solution in your face within a couple seconds yeah i mean especially from a hunting environment like man that's well what else could you could you ask for right like there's no guessing anymore and then learn how to use them too because i don't know how many people i talked to like on my stage with those targets that were kind of uh there was brush behind them well they i couldn't i couldn't count how many rounds are going over the top because they were misranging because they didn't know where their laser was in their reticle and so they had no idea so they were just pinging the, the sagebrush that was a good 50 60 yards behind them and just sailing rounds over the top because it was a big dope difference so you got to you got to know how to use them so you know the laser range finding binos i would say 100 percent, 100 percent. what else so uh for me a sky pod <laughs> i don't have a single rifle i'm gonna take out outside my front door that doesn't have a sky pod on it <laughs> nice. I, I just know that piece of gear so much like i've, I've trust on that those bipods so much um like for josh's i had a double pull and it was perfect it was absolutely perfect i mean there was a couple stages where you really needed it and yeah, it was great. Um, I mean, aside from rifle optic, that's kind of a given. Um, a tripod. Yeah, but there's a caveat to that, right? It has to be a good tripod. Yes, a good tripod. Like, it I mean, has to be a, like, if you good... Get a good tripod. They are so versatile for mm -hmm. in all aspects from spotting to shooting. Like it's, they're hard to beat. If If you can take your tripod and put any sort of like, downward weight on the head when it's fully extended and it just does this like it flexes and moves just with your hand that's not gonna cut it you have to spend the money on a decent like 32 mil or bigger leg tripod it's just that's just how it is and especially and, if you want to throw a, a rifle on top of it it's just that's it and they're not that bad anymore price wise i mean they're coming down a lot and there's a lot more companies making good tripods now for you know that 400 500 price point that will will basically that's what i consider an entry level good tripod now at this point yeah, yeah. And I, I keep seeing it online everybody's like you don't carry no freaking tripod when you're hunting type thing and i'm like you're the dude shooting at an elk a thousand yeah. yards off hands aren't you jackass it's I like a tripod on all my hunts. yeah i'm like yeah, dude yep. i want i want stability especially when i'm glassing i a lot of times like i carry 18s you know and i can't mm -hmm. it's hard as hell to hold them and then I can be able to take that off real quick and set a bag or whatever else right on top of that tripod and shoot. And, you know, a lot of these tripods, even in the 32s, 36s, 39s, they're still super light. I mean, the heaviest thing on the damn thing is the ball head, depending on what head you use. Um, there's there's a lot of great options out there for sure. And I, I, I here's the thing, and I've preached this a million times on this damn podcast, is it's like I am... I want to be the most ethical shooter that I can be. So I'm going to take whatever I need to take um, to get that done. Everybody bitches about ounces, you know, when it comes to it. All right, well, don't eat so many freaking Snickers before you go or whatever you're going to do. 
but that's one of those things that I think needs to be incorporated in a lot of people's, you know, backpacks because they're not that freaking heavy and they're going to give you a leg up running three and a half pounds now for a good lightweight tripod. So it's, that's not, you know, going to put anybody overweight. No. And the other part to this too is, is the amount of people that don't glass using a tripod blows my mind. Yeah. Because like they, if you can get your view to settle and be perfectly still, the amount of stuff you can catch in your in your view is insane. If it's perfectly mm-hmm. still, mm-hmm. Uh, free handing, you just don't get that. Or resting on your knee, not still not a good solution. So yeah. I, I, it's it's honestly mind blowing why it's taken so long. Like they'll use um, a tripod obviously for their uh, spotting scope, but they won't use it for binos, and it just mm-hmm. that blows yeah. my mind. Like I said, I would have never seen some of these giant deer if I hadn't have been super stable and I didn't see their freaking antlers, just the tips. I mean, the top mm-hmm. you know, inch, two inches of them, and they'd just turn with their head and they'd smell and you could kind of see their ears moving. That was the only reason I saw them. And well, there's no way I mean, you could do that. It's easier to see movement with when you're stable. You know, if you're trying to freehand and look for movement, it's almost impossible because everything's fucking moving. You know, if you're stable you can pick up movement <laughs> you can't easier. see movement because literally the whole world's moving especially when you're fat like me and you're probably walking up the mountain anyway and you already can't freaking breathe you're just having a damn yeah. panic asthma attack because you're too out of out of shape you know that's my thing i'll i'll get up on the freaking tripod and just kind of lean there for a minute and get my breath back because i'm too <laughs> out of shape to be able to do it. that's probably why i do go, go work out and do some more of these hunter matches to get back into it what what uh what is the most used caliber on stuff like this? Now, granted, I want all of you listening to understand something. They do it on power factor and stuff, but killing a piece of steel is not like killing an elk. So don't take it like if they're shooting something smaller that that's going to work at a thousand yards for something else. So please don't do that with this. <laughs> but so, what is most people using? I want to say six five Creed for this particular yeah. endeavor. I mean, it's super easy. You can shoot factory in the power factor doesn't apply to you and then it's super abundant and it's super easy to make power factor with it because i shoot 147s at like 2720 and i'm well over power factor i've shot a um a 65 prc last year that was pushing it way too fast um so i had a little bit more recoil 11 pound gun but still super fun super flat but i mean 25 creed some people are stepping into now which is kind of a cool thing i'm not going to step into that i don't have the patience for it anymore but um i think 65 creed is pretty much the go-to it's, right. good balance it's just wait and re- it's recall, so popular so. and it's so easy. That's basically what everybody goes because, like, you can buy ready-made match ammo for it. So, yeah. it's, dude, that, that just horn, shoots. if it doesn't shoot hornady, it's not going to shoot. That's all there is mm-hmm. to it. That's what I that shit shoots too damn good. Well, that's a good fallback too because I I had a hundred rounds of factory in the car just in case, like mm-hmm. Jess or my gun for some reason didn't make power factor. Okay, well I got a factory ammo in the car. I'll shoot the whole match with factory, and now it doesn't matter. So it, it's, yep. it's pretty cool um, to do just six, five Creed and just use, and it's, and it's super painless, super painless. If you load super easy. Cause all, the, like the recipes are out there. It's well known. There's no issues. If you want the easy button for the hunter thing, six, five Creed, that's it. And mm-hmm. just, you can just shoot factory. Don't apply. And it, it don't matter. The only thing that I will say that the other cartridges will give you is a little bit more ranging forgiveness. If it's a little flatter, like the 25s, if you're off five, 10 yards here, or there with ranging, the, it, the, the, the max ord and everything is so flat that your, your, your angular displacement is, is nothing, you know, compared to like a six, five Creed. So I'm a little slower. So if I'm ranging, I might start, my ranges are off. I might start hitting the bottom or miss low. Whereas somebody else pushing something a little faster, they have a little bit more forgiveness with that. So that's something to take in consideration too. But with that, you get recoil unless you're doing the, the 25 Creed deal. Um, Cause those guys are pushing 135, 137s at 29, 30, I want to say. Yeah, I think you're right. So it's, it's moving pretty good. And that's, that's kind of the, the gaming aspect of the general hunter game almost, you know, finding that little bit of edge, which is, which is pretty cool. That pushed the envelope. Because now like- we're seeing more 25 cal bullets. Sounds like two sixty needs to come back out. I love my two sixty. Now I shot that before six five Creed was even as, as popular as it was. I love my damn two sixty. I saw tons of people shooting six five PRC this go around too. I think they just get too hot, don't they? Because it's just so much pressure. Yeah, you're shooting so, a pretty light rifle anyway. Yeah. I I toasted mine trying to RO 
with my PRC. Because you shoot so fast as an RO, you basically yep. shoot a stage, pack up, move, and shoot again. I scorched mine doing it as an RO. I wouldn't recommend shooting as an RO with a PRC. I, I did it, but that barrel I know is is a limited life barrel anyway, one of the cluffs fluted ones. And so it's just like, I, I'm going to run until it dies. I'm going to shoot coyotes with it afterwards. So whatever. Right. Sure. What else did we, uh, let me look at your list. Uh, all right. Growing the shooting community. Did we kind of hit on that a little bit? Yeah. So I want to kind of ask that, like, okay. how do we, how do we grow this? And I think the biggest part is the entry barrier thing. Yeah. yeah that's the steepest, the steepest part. I mean, a lot of matches now, if you go and you look on the NRL Hunter website, a lot of matches are starting to do the free youth with a father slot or a mother slot or whatever. If you're going to shoot with a guardian, you get free entry into the youth and you can share a rifle if you need to, or they have the loaner program where you can share rifles. So, I mean, there's, there's ways to get in there and not have to spend all that money up front to do it. But yeah. that I'd say is the biggest issue is just the cost of entry is just phenomenal for somebody trying to get into the sport right and i think there was i don't know i'm not going to try and go down this rabbit hole but there was a lot of negativity with the different organizations um the fighting back and forth and people just not wanting to get into the drama portion of things and no matter what you're going to have drama with some of the shit right i mean it is what it is but i think a lot of that subsided um you know, and a lot of people are like, well, I just don't have the money. And I, I think that's what's cool about some of these new um, these new rifle companies coming out, you know, with less expensive options that still shoot really well, mm -hmm. you know, with factory ammo and different things. And I think that's been one of the things is with PRS, everybody has kind of thought that you've got to have the best shit on the planet to be able to compete. And I'll be the first one to admit I've got expensive stuff and people have smoked me with cheap stuff. I mean... It's, it's all about the shooter and stuff. And I think that's kind of something that we really need to push as match directors and stuff is you don't need the most expensive shit on the market to be able to come out and at least have fun. I mean, maybe to compete against the top five, top 10 is one thing, but just to come out and have fun is, is something totally different, right? Mm -hmm. I will say Rusty Omer smokes a lot of people with a factory Tika with a note card <laughs> taped to the top of it <laughs> as his it garage shield. <laughs> so, no, I, I agree with you. But, I mean, just have realistic expectations, I think, is is the takeaway there. Like, if you bring, you know, a couple hundred dollar old rifle, you better have realistic expectations what you and that rifle can do because you're not going to be, you know, crushing souls with it. So, yeah, just, just know, like – the competition thing yeah go ro check it out get your feet wet ask questions um but when you start i think a lot of people just don't have realistic expectations or they don't have something they want to get out of it they don't know right like hey i'm i want to do this and i, and I, I have people locally that'll show up and do one or two matches a year as their hunting train up and that i think is actually pretty awesome I encourage them to come back more, but they're like, no, this is, this is about my, my bandwidth for this. I'm like, okay, cool. And they use what they want to use and they shoot. And they know that they're going to they have a five round mag and that's all they want to use. And they're going to shoot at five targets and then they're happy. Like, okay. Those people have realistic expectations, but it's the people that leave with a bad taste in their mouth because they weren't prepared and they didn't really know what they're getting to. And they, they thought they were just going to show up. And I had a couple of friends do this too. Their first match, they show up like, I think I can get top 10. Okay, let's see how that goes. <laughs> but yeah, realistic expectations. I and I think the 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 entry barrier isn't as bad as people think. But if if you want to be that top ten percent, you're gonna have to invest time, energy, money. You have to like that's that the mm -hmm. top because those guys that are, that are you know cleaning matches now, I I don't even want to know how much of his of his total mental capacity he devotes to that it's got to be insane yeah i've lost more freaking matches match points with stupid mental errors than anything i mean just little teeny stupid mental errors that's all there is to it yeah don't give points away you can't get them back <laughs> no you can't and a lot of times a point separates you from two spots three spots you know depending on points and then time or however they break that down i mean a point does a lot of things for for that you know it could be be, be the meaning between a top 10 and top 15 you know 
I mean, it depends on how you do it, but yeah, little stupid mental mistakes, but kind of going into your point and you kind of hit that one of the things, and I wanted to hit this with you guys, you know, it's kind of one of your things is uh, investing in yourself, right? We, we've talked about it many times. I've invested in ammo, invested in my gun. I've invested in my optic. I've invested in anything I can invest in, but I'm still not doing what I need to be doing. Well, why? Well, it's because I haven't invested in training in myself. So I know you kind of wanted to hit that, Matt. Yeah. And, and, uh, there's an internal struggle with that in my household. I'll tell you with the, uh, Hey, you might want to practice or maybe watch some videos or, you know, some recon or something, maybe that'll help prepare you a little bit more, but Hey, whatever priorities. Right. But, and sometimes you get busy with life and work and you don't get to de like devote that time. But that's a big thing is people want to focus on the monetary investment and they like the gear and stuff, but they don't do the mental part of it as well. And then it's like, oh shit, what did I just spend money on? So, I mean, would you, would you expect that you're going to go race a professional racing event without knowing how to drive? Well, no, like you're probably going to want to learn that first. And the, obviously there's different windows of this, but this baby steps all the way. Um, I, I, I don't know, Josh, what are your thoughts on all this, man? Like as, as a two day match director and a two day match winner, I mean, you're, you're more apt to speak to this than I am. Um, I, you hit the nail on the head, man, with that realistic expectations. I've gone into matches where I've shot a lot going into it and I felt good about it and I shot really well at the match. I've also gone to matches where I, come completely just off like a training schedule or something like that. And I spent no time shooting myself and I got really nice gear and I got throttled, you know, it's just, but you knew that going into that match, like I am not prepared for this in any shape or form. And it, the uh, performance showed, you know, so the mental side is definitely there. And it's just, you can't get mad about that. Cause you know that going into it, if you don't train for something or you don't prepare for something and you get throttled then what, I mean, it's expected at, at this point, you know, those guys who win, they train constantly for this. You know, you, you can't say that they don't, they don't just grab the rifle and show up at the match with and go, go to town. Yeah. And one of the things that I found with myself is when I was putting so much pressure on myself to do better, but I wasn't training, I was doing worse because I was in my own head, kicking my own ass. And recently I've had more fun just like going out and shooting and, you know, bullshitting with the people in my squad and, wouldn't you know what my freaking score's going up because mm -hmm. I am not just constantly putting the pressure on my brain because that I've noticed is what really started triggering the forgetfulness, the mind numbing that I could because I was like overthinking everything instead of just going sticking to the basics. Okay, what do I need to do next? What is this? And it was just it wasn't working and it didn't work for me. And I think as a shooter. Um, we all need to figure out what that happy medium is, you know, where, where are you best, um, putting your mind to work, you know, and the mindfulness is something that I a hundred percent need to practice more is, yeah, I can pull a trigger. I can put my sights on a target, but, you know, understanding and slowing down and breaking those processes down as they go through, you know, you talk to Morgan, you talk to Vibbert, you talk to these guys that are constantly hitting top 10. And how they go about breaking this stuff down. And it's just like so methodical and, you know, and they're not overthinking stuff and they've got, this is how we do it. And this is all we think about. And it's like, well, you know, maybe that's been my problem this whole time is I'm thinking about too much shit that I shouldn't be thinking about. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And life gets in the way too. Yeah. Life so, definitely. Yeah. Probably. And then. And that, yeah. that kind of goes back to your whole, you know, growing the sport or getting more people involved in it is there's a lot of people who have that mental thought of how great they are and they don't want to go out and compete and find out the difference, you know? I mean, I hate to say it because we're all prior service guys, but gee, they're the big, they're the worst at it. You know, everybody has the self-proclaimed badass on the range and they know everything about guns, but nobody wants to come out and find the difference, you know, or get their ass kicked by a 13 year old girl or something like that. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. so it's, I'm into it with some humble pie a little bit. Cause I've seen SWAT teams and stuff. I like, man, man, they're the top shit in what they do. And then they come to this and just like take bottom 10 geo on why, but they could have looked at that differently. Like, Hey, I'm coming into yeah. this. 
what can I take away from this to make me better in my day job or better? I, I will say you know, the good ones realize their shortfalls real quick. And they turn around like, okay, I have shit I need to work on and I'll be back next time. Or, Hey, do you mind if I call and text you? Like, absolutely, man. Cause we've got them locally too. You know, we have a couple of, and I saw, I saw this in the pistol shooting in three gun world too. Hey, you like the three gun thing cracked me up because like, Hey, you have all three of these weapons in your patrol car at all times. I'm mm -hmm. not a cop. I'm not going to teach you your ta ta uh, tactics or how do you do your job at all. But I do know that using more of something and learning about it more is never a bad thing. So it just, it cracks me up. And then the excuses of like, well, I have time and I have this, I have that. But then you, you, you get across, you get all these dudes that are just infatuated love it, with it and they love it and they want to learn more about it and they want to be, you know, um, better at their jobs. So, yeah, it goes, you know, it's great two ways. They'll either never be back yep. or they'll be back the next week to figure out how to do it better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's those, the, the ones that come back, the, those are the guys that they end up sticking, sticking around for a long time too. And they, they get real humble and they, and they have a large amount of buy-in, which is, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, the, the prior service guys, they cracked me up. I, I, uh, when I was big into USPSA, I would try to drag so many people from yep. the unit. I'll just, just shoot pistols in one day. You don't even have to have a nice pistol. You don't have to have a nice setup. You just shoot production, 10 round mags. Like it don't even matter. Hell, I even have to help you with ammo, man. Like you get them out there and they think they're top shit. And then all of a sudden they're like, what was that? Like that dude just went screaming by me and did everything in 10 seconds. And it took me almost a minute. Like, yes, I'm trying to tell you this. Yeah. You're, you have no concept. The rifle world's no different. The rifle yeah. world just, I think just takes a little bit more finesse right and there's there's a bunch of the sf guys that i've worked with over the years um and there's still a couple sf guys that i work with now and i mean hell they're a couple of them are instructors and they sneak into these these matches nobody knows who they are they put on somebody else's name and they just show up and they're super humble about it they don't tell anybody else they're in it which is funny because i see their names pop up and i see stuff like people telling them how they should shoot and shit and i'm like you don't you don't know who you're talking to right now but a lot of those guys in those tier 1 groups are starting to see how this is taking their training to another level because they can only train so far where mm -hmm. they're at without yeah. starting to take those other levels and these guys are coming in and doing it and man they're coming back and they're like dude i'm learning so much from this you know the cool thing is, is it's evolved uh, the U.S. Army Sniper Program. It's evolved uh, Scout Sniper Program. It's evolved Special Forces Program. All of these have evolved because of the, the shooting disciplines. And the shooting disciplines have changed so much, or even over the last five years, to affect training and the way things are done. And they've had to rewrite books and school materials and stuff over because of just the shit they've learned they didn't realize they weren't doing. And that's what's so cool about this the sport, I guess. So I get, I get into this debate all the time currently with, with people serving is, is a, well, you know, the army only lets me shoot once or twice a year. Well, that's in uniform. Like the levels of bureaucracy stay there and you can pursue this on your own. And the resources you have available to you outside of that environment are actually way bigger than you could ever imagine. So take it upon yourself to, to push that. And if you have a weak spot, exploit it. And, and do it on your own. And I, I agree with you with the uh, the pseudonyms. I've seen it you, uh, throughout the years, you know. Um, and shooting a couple California matches, there's a couple SEALs that showed up. And these guys were awesome, great dudes, but they just didn't know what they didn't know. And they went into it maybe a little bit skeptical, but by the end of the, the weekend, they were like, holy crap, this is actually awesome. I don't know why people talk shit about this. We can actually, you know, maybe get funding to go do this or take PD, PTDY and then take and, you know, and, and do this as part of our, our job training too, which is awesome because now you've got this bigger, bigger window of training and it's, and it's awesome and seeking those outside instructors. And that's one thing I do like about some of the specialty units in the branches and, and Josh, when you were in bat, you probably got the ability to go to civilian instructors instead of just mm -hmm. staying in schoolhouses and and that in itself is amazing. Like sniper school was well, a was what, a gateway. Yeah, go ahead. That's what most people don't really understand. They're like a lot of prior service, like, oh, this is how the military military does, and this is the only way to do it. Well, when you go into the high level military units, they bring in outside competitive shooters to teach you to shoot. Like they're not there to teach you tactics, they're there to teach you to yeah. shoot. And that's it. Like, yep. and that's what a lot of people don't understand. Now you can do that. You can go and shoot outside and shoot with these guys 
on your dime and you don't, and it's the same thing as going to the high level training programs. I mean, it's just, I mean, not the same thing, obviously, but at least you're getting a taste of it or getting, you know, you're seeing different ways to do stuff that they don't show you in the military or they don't show you at the, at the, where the cops train. Yeah. Yeah. Like guys like Brian Morgan have capitalized on that, man. He's running a hell of a freaking program at Hat Creek and oh, yeah. everybody that is somebody goes and trains there, you know, and that's, mm -hmm. That's what's cool about that kind of stuff is is the but coming back to it, what changed a lot of this was the competition stuff. It's yep. what drives change. It's what drives more actions coming out. It's what drives changes in barrels. It's it's all this competition stuff. And that's what's cool about that side of things to me is how it drives everything. And and co going back to Josh's outside of the box thinking, and that's what's fun about matches. We've all been to matches where you got a barricade, you got a tank trap, you got a couple things. I have tried to go outside the box on my matches and it's usually bit me in the ass every freaking time. Cause I don't, I don't, you're not I don't, put, you're, don't put two spinners at 600 yards like that. Don't get me started. <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> the horse tank the, uh, that was like the horse tank was the worst. The horse tank was the worst. That the double spin. Oh worst. man. That was a battle. God. Yeah, all three of us have been around for a little bit and seen some stuff. And some of it you want to give, like, not, it's just not to bag on Cole at all, but like, there's some match directors that want to do that little bit extra outside the box and, like, we'll see how this goes. Ball of flames. And they're like, oh shit, uh, how do I apologize? And it's like, hey, man, it, like, some people get really mad about it. And it's like, hey, whatever, man. It's just, it's something we do, um, you know, for fun. And some people get like, oh, they want to, like, break shit. So, um, Cole had some notable ones though. I gotta, I gotta tell you that when I shot him, I was just laughing. But yeah. <laughs> some I people had, were very curious. I'm not gonna lie. But yeah. that's the thing is, I pissed people off. I pissed a lot of people off. But I'm like, that wasn't the end. I, me, I like, I'm not the person. I'm always changing shit, like in my rooms and stuff, because I like to see new things. And in my brain, that's why I did it. And when I went through testing him, and that, this is one thing as a match director, you have got to do is you've got to test all the different parameters and possibilities of that stage. Because like, for instance, that double spinner, I'll tell you guys uh, uh, a secret. No one else knows that spinner got broke. I don't know when it got broke. And I didn't know it till after the match or I would have thrown that stage. But sometime during all of that shit, the spinner came completely apart and I didn't know about that. And that's just stuff. That's stuff you can't see though. Right. Yeah. But the way that I had it set up back and forth and all that bullshit, that was something that I shouldn't have done, but we tested that with a big rifle and the big rifle did great with it. I didn't put into context 22 calibers and six calibers on spinning that. And so that is what's hard about being a good match director is thinking of that stuff, but also thinking of all the different possibilities that are going to go into that. And that's, that's the hard part. Yeah, trying to weigh a course of fire so where it's every caliber, you know, is equal is, is tough. Just you trying know, to yeah. weigh a, a course of fire so it's nice and balanced, you'll lose sleep over it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Straight yeah. up. It's but, a pain. I mean, that goes back to like you're talking about growing the sport too. We have to have, you know, stages like that, like the, the infamous horse tank or the dual spinners, because that leads to other ideas. I mean, I don't want to shoot the same PRS barricade every single match, every single place we go i want to see different stages right and that's another thing i think more people need to do is travel like you get a set group of guys who will only stay west and that's the only matches they shoot. i harp on this so much stay east and that's only matches they shoot are out east like you're not getting any crossover until we start getting more crossover i mean then you can start seeing more ideas and better stage design coming out i think mm-hmm yeah, a lot of them came out and shot George Gardner's uh, Hornady PRC match. And <laughs> all that East Coast opinion. boys got a big old freaking slice of humble pie with that shit. Hell, yeah. I, I'm the West Coast boy, and I got humble pie with it. Because he wasn't – that one year that I shot it, he wouldn't ever let you shoot the same target twice. So you had to do a raise and then back and do an array again. And I'm like, holy shit, I've never done this before, and I'm not fast enough. you know. And I was shooting a 308. I learned my lesson there. Yeah. But – <laughs> freaking slow and steady does not win the race when it comes to me. <laughs> 30 mile an hour wins it don't yeah. no. yeah. what did you hold what did you hold uh 0.5 all right uh times 13 uh um, yeah 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 
Freaking... No, and, and it cracks me up too that there's people that say that like there's no difference between East and West Coast. I, I, yes, there definitely is. It's just how the states are are laid out, mm-hmm. man. It's we have like here we don't have trees. We have we have rocks, mountain, and wind. That's what we have. We don't and have trees. These and you get mm-hmm. these and you get that and you get all sorts of shit. Yeah, it's not consistent. Yep. It's not consistent wind ever. No, but I think I think it makes you better all around being in that environment, straight up. Than than you know, with a, a place that's you know you never come off plate. I've shot those places and I didn't necessarily have a great time because I kind of count as wind as the equalizer, you know. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. hey, whatever. Yeah, the humble, the humbling, and then you know, like here at, at Dog Valley. It never stays consistent. It'll be blowing one minute and it'll completely change the next shooter and it'll be pushing up one side and it'll be pushing down the next minute. And I mean, that's that that is what's fun because you as a shooter have got to see that and make your corrections, you know. And it's taken me a long time to slow that down coming back to the mental side of things. Is it is instead of going through a stage and finishing it early with time spared and missing targets, I'd rather not finish the stage and get impacts. I mean, I've kind of started to change that mentality of like, quit trying to go so fast. You're just missing fast, you know? And that's been one thing that's kicked my ass forever. And I've finally started to turn that, you know, in my head around, but that also comes back to practice and everything else. And I, mm-hmm. I just don't practice. I just build guns and look at them. So. Okay. Like that wall back there. Uh, yeah. You haven't seen the vault. It's worse. <laughs> Yeah, I've got way too many guns now. I got to start selling some shit so I can go hunt because that's what I that, originally that's what a lot of us started shooting for is we love mm-hmm. to hunt, right? And uh, now I've gone way too far one way and I've got a shitload of competition rifles and like five or six really nice hunting rifles when it should go the other way. But yeah, I mean, I guess that's the thing is as a shooter, you've got to understand, you know, kind of a breakdown is, you know, what do you want to get from this? What are you getting from shooting? What do you want to achieve? And, um, you know, I guess that's the whole point you've got to ask yourself. And then how good do you want to place? If you want to place good, go invest in yourself and invest in, you know, practice. That's all there is to it because it is. And I understand with life, it is hard to um, set up for practice, but it's never been easier. There's companies like JC Steel, NGM Targets, all these different companies that, have made these really fast target act target systems that you can go out and start shooting in, you know, 10 minutes. And so you can do that. So you can make all the excuses. You, you just don't have time. But if you had a good half hour, you could send, you know, quite a few rounds down range on a target and change different things. And you can do that. So again, it comes down to, excuse me, what you want to get out of this. Right. We haven't had very many questions on this one. No, every so every so often I get a ton of questions, and sometimes I don't. But this is also a Monday, so everybody's probably. Um, I don't usually, know. I kind of I kind of think people are usually mentally checked out by like the afternoon on a Monday, anyway. Yeah, usually Thursdays is pretty good, but I don't know. Sometimes people just like to watch and ask questions. I get, I'll you'll get ten thousand downloads on the podcast, and I'll get questions from that, but. Um, this, this never seems to get the reach, but I also only put it out this morning. If I would have put it out a couple days ago, so everybody could think about it, then that might be something different. I don't know. I just got to have more time, but, um, uh, to finish up, I appreciate your guys' time. I think, you know, hopefully people learn something from this. And if, if you want to go shoot an NRL hunter match, I believe, what is it? NRL hunter.com or NRL hunter. Org, org, I believe org nrlhunter.org um travis sheeta and those guys have done a good job i think it's by sig now or something um go check it out there there's more and more matches popping up and if you don't have time to go shoot an nrl hunter match i guarantee you've probably got a one day match in your area i mean when we started shooting there was nothing like there was one match every couple months here in utah and we all fought to get into that damn thing but now there's tons of matches so there's no excuse that you can't go out there and have some fun um, in your area go check it out uh, if you need help trying to find something that hit us up on long range tactics and i or one of the team guys will 
get you information to one of your local um, gun clubs, gun ranges. And hopefully with the network that we've got, we can introduce you to someone there and they can kind of bring you in and answer the questions. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, Long Range Tactics, um, we're on Facebook, Instagram, um, and longrangetactics.com. I want to finally thank um, Tac Pack. They're one of our new sponsors. Just got another Tac Pack. These things are badass. Um, I think the last one was $260 worth of stuff. It's $149 a month. If you use the code LRT at checkout on the main pack or on the the bigger pack, you get another $70 item. The last one, I got knives. I got a Luth AR butt stock. I got a lot of cool stuff. So go check out tacpack.com. Sign up. You can cancel at any time. Um, maybe go sign up for one of them. Use our code and see what it's all about. But um, the last one, I got like SOG knives. I got a whole bunch of cool stuff. So Go check it hey, out. They make good gifts too. I've given them as gifts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Super there is a, there's a cheaper one. I believe it's forty nine ninety nine, and it comes with like hundred and forty dollars worth of stuff. So you're getting a good return on investment for buying it. So go check out tacpack.com. Um, thanks, Josh. We appreciate you coming on. Hopefully, we're going to see Matt a little bit more. Um, it's good to have people that can help us help me the conversation going instead of me just rambling on about nonsense. <laughs> yeah, because I actually wrote down like bullet points to talk about. It's a, it's a technique. It's a technique. That's all I'm going to say. Usually I just ramble and we just bullshit. But, <laughs> hey, bullet points are good too because when you get stuck, you're like, shit, what was that? Okay. Hey, now we're going to talk about this. So we're good to go. That's what, so That's what you get when you bring an officer into it. Bullet yeah. points and PowerPoint. So I was ready for that. That's next. No. <laughs> You got the non-commissioned officers up top and you got the right. OC down below. So yeah. Um, I'm just thanks, starting Josh. to get ideas. Yeah. Uh, oh, also if you want to do a plug for independence training, um, are you still doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we're still doing all the medical training and all that stuff like that. So they hosted uh, another medical course or training class at my match. Actually. Um, we still do all the rifle, carbine, pistol, all that as well so definitely check them out dude i think that's that's a necessity is medical classes josh that was the first time i actually got to meet glenn and drew and they are amazing people awesome and um if i can ever get a chance to go for taking some classes when i get a little closer to you i am definitely going to do that because um yeah good people to teach so Mm -hmm. yep perhaps and that's i think you're right man medical is one thing that everybody throughout their life will be put in some sort of medical scenario but Everybody wants to carry a gun and plan for smoking down a bad guy. And that's next to never going to happen. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, because I just went through a couple of them because I wanted to be better on the highway, freeway, if I came upon an accident yeah. or something. And two, if something happened in the back country, I want to be able to you know, help somebody out. I went through all that shit in the military, but that was way too long ago. I don't remember it. So these refresher courses are nice. And independence trainings in Arizona, if anybody's wondering about that. So you get to go travel down there and be in the warm for a minute if you want to do it yeah. now. So. Or let us know. And we travel. I've flown all over with them to teach courses. So, all right. so yeah, if you they get a bunch of buddies together, hit them up, see what they can do. Okay. Thanks guys. I appreciate it. And again, if you have questions, long range tactics, hit us up, Facebook, Instagram. Thanks guys. Have a good one. Thank you. Awesome.